Okay, well, good morning once again, dear church family. And um, as usual, I forgot to mention something. Uh, we, were, we are celebrating the fact that in this church, we now have three fully capable worship teams. And this team just filled in at the very last minute. And thank you so much, you guys. God bless you. Um, but Dale Bacher back there, the unseen guy in the sound booth, he's, he's a part of all those teams. He's, he's here faithfully every Sunday. He manages and organizes the website. And we're very grateful for him, too. So a special mention to you there, Dale. God bless you, brother. We don't want people to think that we take them for granted, or that we just look right through them or something. This thing's on, right? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Well, friends, we are uh, under God going through the whole Bible together. That's the goal. We're in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 13. And um, I thought what I would do is read the first 11 verses, and, um, and then we're going to talk about it. And we're going to talk about this very powerful chapter. And if the Lord is pleased to do it, we will seamlessly move into our communion service. So let's listen to Moses instruct Israel. And by extension, he has some a message for us too here in this 13th chapter of Deuteronomy. 13.1 If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign or wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you saying let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. Key verse. That's on the front of our bulletins today. Absolutely key verse. Hold fast to him. Verse 5. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from, from your midst. Verse 6, If your brother, the son of your mother, your son or your daughter, the wife of your bosom, or your friend who is as your own soul, secretly entices you, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers, of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, you shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death and afterward the hand of all the people, and you shall stone him with stones until he dies because he sought to entice you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the house out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So all Israel shall hear and fear and not again do such wickedness as this among you. Very, very powerful instructions there. Almost sounds a little harsh, too harsh maybe. If we were to synopsize the rest of the chapter, you'd see that God gave instructions to Israel through Moses to wipe out entire towns. If there's a whole town that is following after a different God, a pagan God, a God that did not create the heavens and the earth, did not redeem Israel from bondage in Egypt, they were to inquire diligently as to whether or not this thing was really so. And if it was, then they were to obliterate that town. They were to decimate any last vestiges of false pagan religion from their midst. Completely obliterate it. Wipe it clean from the earth. These are very powerful instructions. These, these are very sobering things. They're in our Bible, and we should know what the Bible says, and we should be prepared to talk intelligently about these things. So let's do that. Let's try under God. The main themes here that we're encountering are discernment and intolerance. Ooh, now there's that word intolerance. We'll talk about that later this morning. Discernment and intolerance. Intolerance. These people were to test religious claims. And friends, we are to test religious claims. In fact, Paul told the Thessalonians 
uh, in his first epistle to them, chapter 5, and I think it's verse 23, test all things, hold fast to that which is good. Test all things. That includes uh, religious claims, a very relevant message for our own age. And you know, friends, it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of funny and it's kind of tragic at the same time that the age in which we live, particularly in North America, our citizens are very discerning. We're very discerning. We do, we do put things to the test. But guess what? It's the mundane, stupid things that we put to the test. Things that don't really matter a whole lot, those we're very discerning about, you know? I think about going to a restaurant. You ever go to a restaurant and place your order and the lady comes back or the, or, or the man comes back, the, your server, with, your, with an order? It's not exactly what you ordered. They didn't put ketchup on my hamburger. I think I'll raise a riot in the streets over this, right? We are so discerning about these mundane, stupid things. Lenny and I were just in uh, Grand Forks uh, and I couldn't believe listening to the lady in the table next to us order her meal. It had to be so particular, you know, and you just know when, when the plate comes out, she's going to be inspecting this thing. Very discerning. I think about the clothes we wear. People are very discerning. I think that guy's pants are just a little bit too wide at the bottom now. It's not in style anymore. Uh-oh. <laughs> Elvis Presley is in the building. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're kidding. We're very discerning about fashion, aren't we? Things that don't matter a whole lot, they come into fashion, out of fashion again. Home, how about home decor? People are very discerning about that too. Judging each other on, well, I don't think that carpet quite goes with the picture you have hanging there and all this. They may not say it to your face, but they're thinking it. You know, very, very discerning. But what we're not discerning about, it seems, in our culture, um, is religious claims. Religious claims. It seems that when it comes to religion, anything goes even though the stakes, religiously speaking, are infinitely higher. I mean, religions, they claim to be speaking to you about the eternal destiny of your soul. That is way more important, I think you agree, than how much barbecue sauce was put on my burger this morning or whatever. I think you agree with that. And it's so, uh, it's kind of weird and tragic that when it comes to religion, we don't care. And we're actually kind of pushed into that position where we don't need to care about religious claims. We shouldn't care about them. We shouldn't test them. Right? Um, no, the Bible says you have to test them. Now, the friends, think with me. How, what are you going to test a religious claim with? You're talking to a Muslim or a Baha'i or a follower of Zeus. They exist. <laughs> Any religion under the sun, they come to you with religious claims. Now, what are you going to test those claims with? What are you going to use as your measuring stick? Is it going to be your personal opinion, personal feelings on the matter? How about personal preferences? How about intuition or popular opinion? What are you going to use? You know, popular opinion today, it's very strange. It's the spirit of our age. We have two great schools of thought, religiously speaking, in this part of the world right now. The first is pluralism. You ever hear that word, pluralism? That's the idea that all religions are perfectly fine just as they are. They need no modification or correction. As long as you're sincere, you can slot yourself into any world religion you want, any cult you want, any religious faith community, and you will find your way to God and a right relationship with God. That's called pluralism, and that is, that is part of the spirit of our age. And you don't dare speak out against or correct or critique any other faith system that's out there because in a pluralistic society, everybody, everybody's uh, religious claims are equally true. And you look at that and you say, that can't even possibly be correct. The Muslim says Jesus Christ is not, cannot be the Son of God. The Bible says, yes, he is the Son of God. Absolutely, categorically, he's the Son of God. Now, how on earth are you going to bring those two competing claims together? The Bible says Jesus is the only way to a right relationship with God, our Maker. And the Baha'i says, no, he's not the only legitimate way. How on earth can you say all religious claims are true? 
If you start, honestly, friends, would you agree? If you start affirming such a thing, you've just trafficked into the realm of irrationality. It can't possibly be the case. Well, we have a second great stream of religious thought in our world today, and that's called syncretism. Pluralism says all religions are fine just the way they are. Syncretism says all world religions, all cults, all religious communities, all religious faith commitments are basically true, basically correct. They just need slight modification to get them all in harmony. That's called syncretism. Another, another spirit of our age. But how in the world are you going to bring these things together? How can you bring a pantheistic Hindu who says everything is God into harmony with a Christian who says, no, not everything is God, just the things that are created. Those things are not God. God the Creator is the only thing that is God. Okay. How can you bring pantheism into harmony with theism into harmony with atheism, which is what the classical Buddhist believes? How on earth are you going to do that? It's a lost cause. It can't be done, friends. It just can't be done. We need to test these religious claims, but how are you going to do it? The Christian says we're going to use the Bible. We're going to listen to the God of gods, the King of kings, the God who inhabits eternity, the high and lofty one. He is going to talk to us, and he'll give us truth, truth that is most certain, truth that is irrevisible, doesn't need to be corrected, attitude taken away from truth, eternal truth, God's word is forever settled in the heavens. That's what the Bible declares. And we're going to use this, this Bible right here, and that's going to help us to discern truth from error in the world. And that's important. Friends, that's important. That's the Christian commitment. But you know what that means, don't you? It means that carefully, prayerfully, you need to study the Bible. You need to read the Bible regularly in a disciplined manner. Read it. Ask God for help. Rely on trusted Bible teachers to help you. Get a working knowledge of the Bible. Master its contents. And then you're equipped to discern truth from error. I remember a couple of years back, I was talking to a lady who came to me, and um, she was so concerned that she could discern good from bad in the world, truth from error, religiously. She wanted to know. And I said, well, you need to read the Bible every day in a disciplined, structured uh, manner here. Don't just flip it open and read a verse. But just read it carefully, systematically. And she said, well, I'm not into that, really. I'm not into that kind of thing. Well, I can't help you. I just can't wave a magic wand over you and say, oh, here you go. Now you have discernment. No, it's the Bible. You've got to have a working knowledge of the Bible. So in this church, we're a Bible-preaching church. Jesus has the words of life. Where else are you going to go? You have to go to Jesus and to his Bible. The other thing we notice here in this chapter uh, is not just discernment, which kind of screams out at us, but we are also confronted with the fact that supernatural deception is possible. It's not just that we got particularly wicked and self-seeking and deceptive people out there. It's that such people have satanic help. And that is something we need to acknowledge and realize, wake up to, learn to deal with. There's a Satan in the world. He's not a figment of the imagination. He's not a mythological construct. There is a real, personal, super intelligent, supernatural being. We call him Satan, the adversary. We call him the devil, the accuser. He's the destroyer. He's Abaddon or Apollyon. And he's real. And Peter said that he is roaming the earth right now like a lion seeking whom he may devour. So Peter said, be alert. Open your eyes to these realities. We don't want to close our eyes to anything that's out there. We want to walk in the light. So we're prepared. Moses said, you may have a false prophet here of a false god come on the scene, and he may do something supernatural. He may have a, a prophetic dream. He may predict the future. He may do something spectacular. He may do a sign miracle. What does that prove? You remember the magicians in Pharaoh's court? We talked about those guys, didn't we? They did a miracle. They were absolutely satanically empowered, weren't they? It can happen. And Paul speaks to this exact issue in the New Testament. He's speaking to us. Paul tells us in the epistle to the Galatians, chapter 1, verse 8, and verse 9, he repeats himself. 
He says, even if we, what does he mean by that? We, who we? Apostles, sent ones, those who are sent by Jesus with apostolic authority, even if we, or what? An angel from heaven preach any other gospel than what we preached, let him be accursed, anathema, damn him to hell. Paul there is very clear. I'm going to, Paul's thinking, I am going to insulate the gospel message of Jesus Christ so that it is absolutely protected from corruption, alteration, amendment, addition, or subtraction. Paul says, even if I went crazy and started preaching a different gospel, don't you dare believe me now. But notice that he said, and even if an angel from heaven comes, an angelic messenger may come with a different gospel message. And Paul says, don't you dare believe it. Don't you dare believe it. Apparent supernatural endorsement of a particular message does not mean that that message is from God. And our churches need to hear this. Because North America and around the world, we have countless professing Christian congregations, organizations that are experiencing quote-unquote miraculous supernatural endorsement of their message. And we see people, they point to weeping Madonnas and all kinds of crazy things. I'm not going to get in too far into that, but you hear what I'm saying. There's a devil in the world. He's got messengers that work under him. He is their king, and he, is, he directs supernatural deception in the world, even today. Paul told Timothy that in the latter times, some would dis- depart from the faith. You'd see people falling away, leaving the Christian church. And Paul says that these people would be giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. That's 1 Timothy 4. Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. That means that demons are teaching people things. Doctrines, teachings. Evil spirits teaching people things contrary to what God has declared in his infallible sacred library, the Bible. When Paul's words here are just an echo of something that Jesus Christ said earlier during his earthly ministry, there in the the 13th chapter of Mark's epistle, we have Jesus addressing his disciples. He's instructing them in the latter times. And the first thing out of his mouth is, see that no one deceives you. Don't be deceived. And, you know, I talk to cult members, Mormons, and Jehovah's Witnesses, and so on, and I say to them, listen, the Bible does not multiply references to false teachers and false prophets for no reason. It's because they're sometimes hard to spot. If they were just so obvious, the Bible wouldn't need to be so replete with warnings about them. Right? Jesus said, take heed that no one deceives you, for false Christs, and false prophets will arise and show what? Signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. That's Jesus' warnings, a call to discernment in the latter times, which, friends, I kind of think we're in right now. Paul tells us through his second epistle to the Thessalonian believers that the Antichrist will, will come to the world stage in the future. And his coming will be in accordance with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Supernatural deception throughout earth history, but particularly in the latter times. What are we going to test religious claims with? You don't say supernatural sign miracles, that is the stamp of authenticity, because the Bible is warning us. Because you see a magic trick, or because you see something you can't explain, something that maybe really is supernatural, that does not mean the message that that sign accompanies is from God. You know, and if you didn't have God's word, how on earth would you tease truth from error? What would you have? You can't rely on your own opinions here. You can't rely on your own intuitions. You can't rely on your heart. You can't rely on personal opinion or popular opinion or anything but God's perfect, infallible word to you, to me. If we didn't have the Bible, we'd be meandering in darkness. Don't you just want to thank God for the Bible? Say, thank you, God. Thank you. Well, the other thing we see here in this chapter, and this is 
very, very difficult in our day and age. It's just this, friends. Family comes second. Family comes second. You see verses 6 to 9? Even if your brother wants you to go after a different God, even if mother or wife or children or your friend that's, that is as your own soul, if these people are enticing you to abandon your God who redeemed you, well, under the Mosaic law, you're to kill them. Now, under the New Covenant, we don't, obviously, we don't do that stuff, right? I don't need to say that. We don't take up arms. We're not violent with people. Uh, but we don't accept false religious claims. We don't agree that they are every bit as true or helpful or godly as the claims of the Bible. But family comes second in this. Now, I want to make some qualifying remarks, okay? Family is God's idea. It's part of a very good world. God created a world. It was very good. He pronounced it very good after he had established the first home and family. God looked at solitary, lone Adam there in the garden and said, not good. You need a wife. And when that wife was created and brought to Adam in a beautiful marriage ceremony there in paradise, then God could look at the created order and say, very good. Here's a beautiful, perfect, godly couple. They're married in my eyes, and they're equipped to have children and have a home, family, beautiful, love, harmonious relationship that will mirror the Trinity. So home and family is God's idea. It's part of a very good world. It reflects the Godhead. And Scripture is replete with references to the value of home and family and instructions on how to have a godly family. God is not disrespecting family, that's for sure. He's not endorsing the abandonment of family or devaluing the family, but God is saying if you have family members that are rejecting Christ right now, then there needs to be division in that home. The right kind of division, even in the home. Now, what do you mean by the right kind of division? Well, we're not talking about bitter hatred. Just simply clear, obvious distinction. There has got to be a distinction made. I trust Christ the Lord with my soul. I love him. He died for me. He has, a, he has work for me to do. He's given me a new identity, a new pedigree, a place in heaven, a place in the kingdom. And I have a family member that rejects that. They do not believe that Jesus is God, don't believe he died for the sins of the world. Um, religiously, we're going to have to just acknowledge that there's a real difference here in our opinions, right? We don't, and we're not going to pretend like, well, that's true for you and that's true for me, and so both views are true. No, we're, let's just acknowledge that these, both these views cannot both be true at the same time. Somebody here is wrong. Clear, obvious distinction. Respectful, yes, but it's got to be there. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 24 and following, he said, don't think that I've come to bring peace on this earth. I've not come to bring peace but a sword. And I'm here to set at variance a man against his father and the daughter against the mother and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. And he said in verse 35, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. When it comes to who is really ultimate around here, and that's God, we are going to have a real difference of opinion with the non-believer. We're just not going to be able to go along and get along on that topic and on any related topic. And that's hard. That's hard. Division in the home. But friends, you must love God first. Someone asked Billy Graham one time, I saw this interview, he said, Billy Graham, do you love God more than you love your wife? And you could tell by the tone of the interviewer, he, really, he was trying to catch him. What will Billy Graham say to this one? Because if he says he loves God more than his wife, well, that's like the unpardonable sin. Your wife is really going to have it in for you, Billy, if you say something like that. And if you say you love your wife more than God, what kind of evangelist are you? And Billy Graham said something very wise. He said, you know what? I'm compelled to love God more than my wife because he designed her and created her, and he brought us together. I have God to thank for her. So I love my wife so very much, but I need to love God more because he brought her into my life. That was wise. Do you love your family? You love home and family? You love wife, children, brothers, sisters, mom, dad? 
you love them, God created them. And he, and he loves them and he wants to save them. He paid their sin debt on the cross. Of course you have to love God more. At the end of the day, friends, your family members, none of them, shed one drop of blood to secure your redemption. But Jesus did. In fact, Jesus says in Luke 14, if you don't hate your family, you can't be my disciple. Now, of course, you understand that Jesus there is using hyperbole, right? He is a Jewish rabbi. He uses figures of speech. He does conscious exaggeration for the, you know, the purpose of making a very strong point. You know that he doesn't really want you to hate, really hate mom and dad. You know that. Because elsewhere, he laid into the religious leaders of his day for not honoring their mom and dad. Okay? So he doesn't really, but he's just saying, by comparison, the love you have for him is going to make your, the love that you have for mom and dad look like hatred. That's all he's saying there. And that's the kind of love for him he is demanding if you want to be his disciple. Okay? Now, very quickly, a couple of thoughts on intolerance. Okay? We hear a lot about tolerance. Friends, you need to be intolerant. How often do you hear that? See, I think the government's just about to come in here and pull that pastor off that pulpit. <laughs> he's, he's declaring that we need to be intolerant. Yes, you need to be intolerant. The, the Bible said so. And you already are intolerant, aren't you? How many people here are intolerant of bedbugs? <laughs> you find one bedbug in your home. Do you say, well, it's just one. It's all right. I'll just, same old, same old. <laughs> You are intolerant of vermin in your house. You don't want one mouse in your, in your home. You don't want one bed bug in your home. You don't want vermin. Friends, you don't want cancer. Some of our dear precious brothers and sisters in this congregation are contending with this thing called cancer. You want a doctor who is intolerant of cancer, don't you? He doesn't put you under a CT scan and say, well, we found some cancer, but I think we can tolerate that for the moment. Who talks like that? No. Things like vermin and cancer and dead bugs and whatever else, we're intolerant because at the very least, they're afflictions. And at the very most, they're deadly. And when we're talking about religious claims, our souls hang in the balance here. Infinitely more important than bed bugs or any physical ailment that could afflict us, right? There's only one God, the true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who sent his only son into the world to pay our sin debt, only that God is powerful enough to rescue us from the penalty of our sins. Only that God is wise enough, powerful enough, and loving enough to actually do it. All other gods that have ever been entertained by the mind of fallen man are absolutely effete. That means they can't do anything. You remember Elijah? He squared off against hundreds of false prophets, of false gods, and they cried out to their God, O oh, Baal, hear us! They chanted that all day long. And they slashed themselves to get sympathy from their reluctant God. And you know what their God did? Nothing. Zero. Why? Because he didn't exist. I like how John Whitcomb puts it. He says, you know why Baal didn't do anything? Because he didn't exist, and that is a real obstacle to getting anything done. <laughs> right? You first have to exist to do something. And the gods of the nations are phony. They don't exist. They're finite, they're phony, they're fake, and they can't do a thing to save you. The stakes are so high. We need to be intolerant of false religious claims. We don't accept them. We don't go running around forcing people to convert to Christianity with a sword. We don't do that. We don't pressure people. If people don't want to talk about it, that's fine. We won't talk to you about it. That's okay. But to the extent that people do want to talk about these things, we need to let them know the truth. We need to tell them the truth. That's Ephesians 5.11. Remember that? Have nothing to do, says Paul, with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Show them the error. Instruct them. That's 2 Timothy 2. Instruct these people. Their false religious claims, their false worldviews, the error that they're walking in is causing them to oppose themselves in their thinking. Paul says, in meekness, in humility, with patience, instruct those who oppose themselves that way. Last thing I'll mention is, notice the references here in Deuteronomy 13 to Israel's redemptive history. 
More than once we hear that God has redeemed these people. He rescued them. Egypt would have destroyed that nation. Bitter bondage. A genocide program in place to execute the baby boys. And God rescued that nation. They owe their, they owe their existence today to the triune God of the Bible. Friends, we owe our salvation to that same God. God demonstrated his love for Israel in that he rescued them from Egypt, and that God demonstrates his love for us at the cross. And that's what we're here to think about, especially today on a Communion Sunday. Our redemptive history, in the light of what God has done for us in Christ, we don't dare entertain the idea for one second that a religious system that denies Jesus could possibly be true. We don't entertain that. It can't be true. Not possibly. Impossible. Why? Because God said so. Not because I said so, because God said so. I want you to think of the cross and uh, think of the love that was displayed there. And then think of Deuteronomy chapter 13. In Deuteronomy 13, we have these harsh, harsh penalties, the death penalty, a death penalty against a false prophet of a false god. False prophets of false gods with false messages are to be executed in the public square under the Mosaic law. Now think of Christ the Lord, the true prophet of the true God who taught a true message. He was executed in the public square. He didn't do anything wrong. He's the prophet that Moses talked about, Deuteronomy 18. He is that prophet. He only spoke words of truth that he heard from his father. He only did good. He only led people towards the true God. And yet he was executed as though he were one of these false prophets. And once again, friends, you are confronted with the doctrine of substitution. There's Jesus taking the place of the false prophet, dying in his place, dying as though he were a false prophet and a guilty Judean king. Well, dear church, we want to remember that awesome price that was paid as we partake of the elements now. And um, I think I'll just offer a word of prayer, and then uh, Marco and Kent are going to help me serve the elements, okay? And we'll honor the Lord the way he instructed us to do that. Okay, so let's, ha let's have a word of prayer. Our great God and Savior, we thank you this morning for reminding us about uh, how great you are and how intolerant you are of sin. We thank you that we serve a God who punishes sin. We thank you that we serve a God who is just, who does not pretend that moral evil didn't happen, a God who deals with evil. Thank you that you're such a God. And we also thank you that you're merciful and you don't want to punish us for our sin. We thank you that you sent Jesus Christ into the world to pay our sin debt. Oh, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the gospel message, which is your power unto salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. We thank you today, Lord, that you've instructed us, ordained it, that we should gather together regularly to honor you. And in this particular way, where we break the bread and partake of the cup, we ask for your, your help and instruction here today, O oh God. We want to take communion with hearts that are soft towards the Savior. We want to do this legitimately in a God-honoring way, to the end that you are greatly praised and that your people are greatly edified. And we ask it in the precious name of Jesus our Lord now. Amen and amen.